So lumped parameter analysis is great, and we've decided that we can use it when the BO number is less than 0.1. But we have to ask the question, what about when the BO number is more than 0.1? What about when we'd like to ignore the position dependence, but we simply cannot? And so now, let's go back to our roast. Uh, the, the guests didn't like the idea of cooking a steel ball for our, our Thanksgiving dinner, and so we've got to actually cook meat instead. Okay. So we, don't, we still don't want our guests to get sick, even though they seem to be somewhat picky. But we're going to put the meat in the oven, try to figure out how long it takes. Now, the meat is going to be a fairly complicated shape. We know that, say, if it starts out hot as it's sitting out, it's going to cool. The outside is going to cool first, so the, the center will remain hot. On the other hand, if we put it in the oven and it's, say, frozen or, or cold, well, then we've got to leave it in for a certain amount of time so the heat can quarter, sort of soak in, right, and move in from the outside toward the middle. And so this, this is a problem, but we really need to solve it, right? So what if there's significant conductive resistance to heat transfer within the body? That's the problem we need to solve. Well, I'm not going to show you the details of this, but it turns out that it's a very difficult problem, practically intractable without uh, finite element analysis. There are, however, some shapes that we can analyze and get a closed form solution, a, solu a mathematical solution, a solution that is reasonable in some cases. You see, what you have to do is you have to model the heat in a differential equation, and you have to calculate what happens over time. You have to integrate the equation over time. It's a mess, and I've seen it done. I don't see a lot of value in it, so I'm not going to show you the derivation of all these models. Rather, I'm going to show you that we can solve exactly three models. There's one more model we'll talk about later that also has an exact solution, but for right now, these three are very similar to each other. So we'll start off with a just a simple wall. Think of a, a an infinite wall that goes on forever so that heat is transferring through that wall normal to the surface of the wall. And that's not really transferring through. This is a body that uh, um, starts off at some temperature and is transferring heat with a fluid around it, but we've got it's kind of like a hot wall with fluid on either side that's cooling down. That's more what it's like, okay? There's still heat transferring through the wall, but it's coming, say, out from the center, go or from the center going outward, or maybe the, the fluid around the wall is hot, and so it's going inward. Now, it's, it's a mirror image thing, so there's a center line, and the temperature at the center is, you know, if the wall starts off hotter, then it's hotter than the surroundings. And this is not something that we could use very well uh, for a wall in your home because in your home usually what happens is there's a, a difference in t temperature on either side of the wall. That's not what we're talking about here. Now, this is an interesting problem even though you might look at it and say, well, that's, <laughs> that's impractical. impractical. You just said this is an infinite wall. There's no such thing. Well, we're really not trying to model an infinite wall. What we're trying to do is get a single direction of heat transfer. Now you might look at it and say, well, that doesn't make sense because you just said that the wall is hot and heat's going to flow from the center line out in both directions. That's two directions. No, not really, because it's a mirror image thing. It's really just one direction. The other side is just the same. So this actually is a tractable problem. It's something that we can solve. And so the solutions are, are done, in fact, and, and they kind of make sense. I mean, if you look at them, they show you what's happening on the right-hand side. You see where the, the temperature starts uniform in the wall at T sub I. As time goes on, the center temperature doesn't drop, but the, the walls, wall temperatures do drop very quickly. So when time is some small amount of time, T1, the sides drop, and you can see we've got a temperature axis. But, of course, this happens along the entire cross-section of the wall, okay, in all directions. We're just looking at a temperature profile here. As time goes on, T equals T2. Well, the temperature in the center is still at the initial temperature, but the, everywhere else, the, the uh, temperature has dropped quite a lot, especially at the outside edges. Uh, T equal T3, well, finally, the center temperature is dropping as well, and if we wait for a very long time, then the temperature of the wall will go to the temperature of the surrounding fluid. And this all should make sense to us. So the temperature in the wall will drop, and the, the solution seems reasonable. And so this is our first model. This is our model for a wall. What about the other two models? Well, the next model is a long cylinder. Now, how is that a single direction? Well, we can define a radial direction, and it doesn't matter what angle you talk about. Again, it's sort of still a mirror image. It's the same no matter what direction you look at. So there's fluid all the way around this cylinder, and the cylinder extends for infinity in uh, the upward and downward direction, and you look at that again, you say, well, what use is that? Well, there are actually cases where this is reasonable. Now, we're not saying that 
that there's actually infinite cylinders. We're just saying, what if heat transfer occurs only in the radial direction? Well, it's solvable. It's something that you can solve, and the solution kind of looks like what we've got in the plane wall. And it turns out you can do the same thing for the sphere, because in the sphere, you can rotate the radial direction vector in any direction you like, and that's basically just a single direction of heat transfer. So all three of these can be solved exactly. However, we need some dimensionless numbers in order to do it. So you've already seen the dimensionless temperature. Now we're going to give it its own symbol, theta. And understand that we've only got a single direction in each of these cases, right? In the case of the wall, it's an x-coordinate direction. In the case of the uh, cylinder, it's a radial direction, as it is in the case of the sphere. So instead of having an x, we would just have an r, comma t. So we're just saying that the dimensionless t temperature of the body depends on when you look at a particular point in the body, right? In that particular point is going to be just x. You tell me what point, you tell me what time, and I'll tell you what the temperature is at that point in time. You see, that's what we're doing here. And so it doesn't matter if you look on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. It's a mirror image. So your x would be measured from the center in the wall, the case of the wall, or in the case of the cylinder and the sphere. It's measured out from the wall. And so it would be convenient, rather than having an actual dimension to have a dimensionless dimension. And so that would be a capital X in the case of the wall equals the particular position you're interested in divided by the half thickness of the wall L. Because remember, we're measuring position from the center of the wall. So this capital X would vary between zero, which is at the center of the wall, to one, the outside surface of the wall. And of course, halfway in between, which would be, let's see, center line of the wall, outside of the wall, halfway between would be a capital X value of a half. Now, the BO number really is a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. That's really what it is. And so it's HL over K. Now, in this case, understand that we're going to define what length we want to use. And the one that's floating around that makes the most sense is the half thickness of the wall, L. Since we've already used that, we'll define the BO number based on that. Now, whether uh, the volume to area ratio of an infinite wall is actually L, the half thickness of the wall. I think it is, if I remember right. It doesn't matter. As long as we're consistent and we base our BO number on this, then we'll be okay. Now, be careful here. If you're trying to decide whether you can use lump parameter analysis on a wall, you have to use the volume to area ratio of the wall. Okay? That's definite. That's something that goes with lump parameter analysis. But if you've thrown away lump parameter analysis and you decide, you know what, I have to take into account the position within the wall because the temperature there depends on position, well then you have to use a BO number like this where we're based on the half thickness of the wall. And you may have to recompute the BO number in that case because we're going to use it a little bit later. But this is not the BO number that decides whether or not we have to use this model. There's also something called dimensionless time, and it's the Fourier number, and it involves the thermal diffusivity alpha, the amount of time that has elapsed, and the length that we've said is, is useful to us, that length squared, the half thickness of the wall squared. So in the case where we're using a sphere or a cylinder, the characteristic length, rather than being L, will be the outside radius, and the position, rather than being an X, will be the particular radius where we want the temperature at the given time. So notice that the BO number does not change. So when you start a problem that is a transient heat transfer problem, and the temperature will depend on the position within the body and time, go ahead and calculate the BO number, because you can use it throughout the entire problem solution. But if you're interested in what happens in the body, as a function of time, you'll have to recompute the Fourier number. Or if you have, you know, if you're interested in multiple positions within the body, you'll have to recompute capital X. Now remember that the thermal diffusivity has to do with the ratio of heat stored to heat conducted through or transferred through the body. The Fourier number is like that. It's really the rate at which heat is conducted across the body divided by the rate at which it is stored. All we've done is thrown time and a length in there. So don't worry about the, the minor differences between the Fourier number and the thermal diffusivity. All we're really doing is taking the thermal diffusivity and make it include time and make it dimensionless so that it will work in all of our equations. So finally, here are the equations. The dimensionless temperatures are written in terms of a1 and alpha1 and an e to the Fourier number type of term. So let's break these down one at a time. On the left hand side of the equation is the dimensionless temperature. 
And what we're really interested in that is the temperature as a function of position and time. For the case of the plate or plain wall, it's the temperature as a function of position within the wall and time. In the case of the cylinder, it's the temperature as a function of the radial distance from the center line within the wall and time, and same thing in the sphere. Now in some printings of your text, this is wrong, so make sure that the equations match these equations in your book. So go to page 474 and 475 and pause the video and scour through the equations. There's several different errors and it depends on what printing you have, so verify every term and make sure they match. So the other terms in the, the dimensionless temperature, for example, are T sub infinity, the temperature of the fluid around the body, the, the wall, the cylinder, the sphere, and the initial temperature of the body, T sub i. On the right-hand side, the terms are broken down into two parts. There's the term in the parentheses, and then the other modifying term. The first term really takes into account time. You notice that in the exponent, e to the negative lambda 1 squared tau, tau is the Fourier number, and that's the number that has time in it. So that, that first piece is basically the time-dependent piece. And then the second piece, in the case of the wall, the cosine of lambda 1 x over L, takes into account the position dependence. It breaks it up into two separate parts. Now these equations only work for Fourier numbers greater than, I think, 0.2 or so. Look in your text, or maybe it's less than 0.2. I, th I think it's greater than 0.2, but look and make sure. There are restrictions on these because actually the solution has an infinite number of terms in it uh, when you solve the differential equation. M a lot of times you can neglect several of those terms, and it's, it's dependent on the Fourier number when you can neglect it. So make sure you know when that is. And of course, you're calculating the Fourier number so you can see if it's valid to use this approach anyway. Uh, so that's how this is broken down. And all of them are broken down this way. So you basically have time dependence and then position dependence on the right-hand side of the equation. It's set up the same way for the cylinder and the sphere. And probably for the sphere, you look at it and say, yeah, that's a little more complicated, but I know where the sign button is on my, my uh, calculator, so yeah, okay. If we could get this A1 and lambda 1, wherever they come from, would be all right. But what's this J0 thing? Well, these are bezel functions. Now, don't worry too much about bezel functions, right? I mean, think about the sine function or cosine. Do you know how to take, say, a 20 degree angle and compute by hand the sine or cosine of that 20 degree angle? I mean, sometimes you know them right off. Like, I mean, sine or cosine of 45 degrees is just one. Because right, you can relate to that to a triangle and you know what it is. But, and you know, simple things like cosine of 0 is 0, sine of 0 is 1, and so forth. But what about some other? Give me the cosine off the top of your head of 23.5 degrees, right? It doesn't happen. It's a button on your calculator. Basically, you give the calculator an input, it gives you an output that is the function of that, right? It somehow computes it. It doesn't matter, it's just a result. Well, that's the way this so-called zeroth order bezel function works. Table 9-2 is where you'll get, or where you will get it. Now, notice that all we're really doing is saying, okay, we're going to put lambda 1 r, which is the position we're interested in, in the cylinder, divided by r naught, the outer radius of the cylinder. We're going to put that into the zeroth order bezel function. So let's just call it this squiggly line here. It's a Greek character. I think it's xi. I can never remember the name. It doesn't matter. Let's call it the, the snake, okay? We've calculated this number that is the argument that goes into the zeroth order bezel function. We've calculated this number, and we can just look it up. It's as simple as looking up the number that we've come up with to then go over and read off the zeroth order bezel function and then put that back in and replace the whole mess with just what we find in the right-hand column. Now, sometimes we'll have to interpolate. I mean, what if the argument lambda 1 r over r naught comes out to 0 0.05? Well, we just need to interpolate between 1 and 0.9975. It's halfway between, right? So that's not all that difficult. But then you just replace the whole thing, J0 of that, with whatever you've read off from that middle column. And it's, it's simple. Just like hitting a sine or cosine. Some calculators may have the zeroth order bezel function built in. Now, there's a first order bezel function as well. We'll use that later. But remember, you need to know where table 9-2 is. As a matter of fact, Page 474 and 475 really deserve a tab. There's so much here. Because one thing I haven't even mentioned is A1 and lambda 1. A1 and lambda 1 actually come from table 9-1. And they are functions of the BO number. You may have looked at this and say, okay, I, I get it that x over L is that dimensionless position. I get that, uh, you know, 
the left hand side is the uh, dimensionless temperature. I get that tau is the Fourier number. It's the dimensionless time. But where did the BO number get off to? Right? It's gone. Where did it go? Well, it is what determines a one and lambda one. So you look on table 9-1 at the first column and be really careful. It's really easy in this table to need the BO number of say 0 .04 and accidentally read off 0.4. Make sure you're reading it off correctly, okay? But all you really do, let's say you have a BO number of point, uh, let's say 0.8, okay? Then all you have to do in the case of the plain slab is go over uh, one column to 0 0.7910 and that's lambda 1. Now my I should have chosen, I guess I should have chosen a BO number of three. Let's go with that. Okay, so BO number of three, if I'm dealing with a plane wall or a plate or plane wall, then my lambda one value is 1.1925. If you don't see where I got that from, you need to figure it out. Get yourself a sheet of paper, put it under a BO number of three, and just read across. Now, why am I saying lambda one is 1.1925? Why is it not 1.7887? That's another lambda one column. Well, because I said I was dealing with a plain wall or a plate or a slab, okay? That's what that first section is. And you can read off A1 the same way. So if I care about a BO number of three for whatever reason in a plain slab or a plate or wall, I'm using that top equation. Well, then I will also need A1 equal 1.2102. Now, if I'm trying to get the A1 and lambda 1 for a cylinder or a sphere, I just messed up. I read off the wrong column, didn't I? If it was a cylinder, that's when lambda 1 would be 1.7887 and A1 would be 1.4191. If it was a sphere, you can read the numbers there. I won't read them. There's no point. Now, how many times do you think you actually come up with a BO number that's on this table? Not very often, unless it's an exam. A lot of times on exams, I will try to give you nice round numbers so that you do not have to interpolate in the, the tables. And so watch out for that because that can kind of give you a little boost of confidence in these problems. So if you're on an exam and you come up with a real nice round number, it's super easy to read off in the table. There's no interpolation. You know, hey, I'm, I'm on the path that CISC wants me on here, okay? Now, a lot of times we don't actually need to use those complicated equations. A lot of times we don't care about position dependence because all we care about is the center temperature. In the case of cooking the turkey in the oven, do you care what the outside temperature is? I mean, obviously you don't want to go, to go too high, but you need the center temperature to get to a certain point so that part of the bird doesn't make people sick. So what you really care about is the center temperature of the meat. And in many cases, that's what you care about. If you need to heat up, I don't know, a steel ball for heat treatment. Well, it's nice that the outside is hot, but if the inside's not, it will not heat treat properly. So very often we care about the center of these objects, the center of the plate, that, that line, or the center line of the cylinder, or the center point of the sphere. You notice how we went from a plane to a line to a point. Okay, that's the reason we can solve these problems. Anyway, so that is given a special symbol called theta naught. Now it's still a dimensionless temperature, but now it's temperature at the center as a function of time and not position anymore, minus the temperature of the fluid divided by the difference between the initial temperature of the body and the temperature of the fluid. Okay, so you see that there in the middle for each of these. And then notice that that piece at the end that was the position dependence is simply gone. And we just have that time dependent piece, A1 e to the negative lambda 1 squared tau. Now, again, look in your book. I think all these equations are usually correct, but double check them and make sure that they are correct in your text. Now, a lot of times we're interested in another thing. We may be very interested in how much energy has been poured into the body or removed from the body. Okay, so if the body's cold, say we've got a sphere that's cold and we're trying to pour energy into it, then what we care about is how much heat has been transferred in versus the maximum amount that could be transferred in. Now remember, Q max is still from properties of the body, right? It's the MCP delta T. That's all that is. But uh, the amount of heat transfer that has been accomplished, we could take that as a ratio to the maximum, and this is a number that will vary from zero to one, right? At the beginning of the process, when we've just stuck our steel ball in the oven, well, no heat transfer has been accomplished. Q equals zero, and this ratio is exactly zero. But if we leave the ball in for an infinite or very long amount of time, then essentially Q over Q max will become one. In other words, the amount of heat transfer transferred into the ball will be equal to the maximum it can hold. Its temperature will be at the surrounding fluid temperature.
Now notice that we can plug in the center line dimensionless temperatures, theta sub naught or theta sub zero, from the appropriate equation, and either sine or the first order bezel function, or sine and cosine in the case of the sphere, to come up with the what's called the, the accomplished temperature or the accomplished heat transfer, we can call it. Okay. So a lot of people refer to this as the unaccomplished uh, temperature change, but really it's the fraction of heat that's been transferred versus the maximum amount that could be transferred. So basically what we're doing here is we've got this big gigantic box where we calculate a bunch of dimensionless numbers, the dimensionless heat transfer coefficient or the BO number, the dimensionless time, the Fourier number tall, and the non-dimensional or dimensionless position, capital X, which is x over l, we plug it into these equations, right, for either, you know, whichever model is appropriate, and come out with a non-dimensional temperature. Well, that's kind of a pain, and you probably don't really like doing this, and a lot of times students will make mistakes, and one little mistake throws your final answer way off. It's kind of like, you know, a very sensitive golf game. And by the way, the restriction I was trying to come up with is that the Fourier number has to be greater than 0.2 for all of these, and remember, it's a non-dimensional thing. And by the way, anytime you write a dimensionless number, I expect to see brackets after it, or parentheses, with ND to let me know that you know it is dimensionless. But guess what? We don't have to do this. There are charts we can use instead of these equations. You still need the BO number. You still need the Fourier number. You still need the dimensionless position. But you can use that and plug them into the charts and come out with the dimensionless temperature. You get the same thing. Now, Unfortunately, the charts in your book are wrong. They are messed up. I don't know how they got messed up, but when you come to a homework on this, I have posted some charts from another textbook that focuses only on heat transfer. Those I have verified and are correct. So when you're solving problems, you can look at the charts in the book, but don't use them. Use the charts that are in the PDF file that I've posted for you. I have not actually seen a printing of this book yet that has all the charts correct. Okay, so how do we use these charts? Well, the upper chart, and you should turn to the page that has these, and these are worth a bookmark also because they're so convenient. If we're interested in the center line, then the upper chart is the only thing we need because that gives us kind of that first term in the equation. It gives us that A1e to the negative lambda 1 squared tau, and we don't have to plug any of that into our calculator. All we have to do is locate the BO number, that tells us what line we're on, and the Fourier number, that gives us the x-axis, and we go up, read off the curve, uh, you know, just go to the left-hand side, the y-axis, and that gives us our center line dimensionless temperature. Be careful here because it's actually one over the BO number. So you calculate the BO number and then you invert it. That tells you what line you're on. And this is the chart for the plane wall. And it's probably wrong because I think I scanned it from the text. But again, schematically, you understand what we're doing here. So this is the equation that we're replacing basically with a chart. And what if, though, we don't want that? What if it's not the center line temperature? What if we want position dependence. In other words, some other point besides the center plane of that wall. Then what? Well, then notice that we've already got the first term in the plate wall equation, the A1e to the negative lambda 1 squared tall. That's what this chart gave us. That's that dimensionless temperature on the left-hand side, the y-axis theta naught. Okay, so basically the other piece, the cosine of lambda 1 x over L, that's the, the last piece, and unfortunately, we're just going to call this theta. Now, that's confusing because there's theta as a function of xt, and this theta is different. Don't worry about it too much. Basically, there's just two different charts that represent those two terms on the right-hand side of the equation. The one in parentheses we've already got, that's theta naught. The other one, okay, so you see we've already got that. The other term besides the theta naught, this term, comes from another chart. That's the cosine lambda 1 x over L piece, and that comes from this other chart. So all you have to do again is read off the BO number from the x-axis, well really it's 1 over the BO number, and then go to the dimensionless position curve, so x over L. So what fraction from the center of the wall do you want? All the way out at the surface, where x over L is equal to 1, or somewhere within the surface, you know, at say 20% or so, that's that top curve, 0.2. So you find 1 over the BO number, go up to the appropriate curve that represents the position of interest, and then go over to the left, and that gives you theta. Now, it's not, it's not the whole theta you want. It's not theta of xt. You have to multiply it by the theta naught you got from the upper chart. But when you do that, 
You don't have to use equations. Okay, well that's nice, but there was another equation that was the unaccomplished, or the accomplished, I think you should call it, heat transfer amount, the heat transfer percentage. There's another chart for that equation, so you don't have to use that equation either. Q over Q max, the y-axis on this chart, is a function of the BO number. Well, it's actually the BO number squared times the Fourier number. That's on the x-axis. And then the BO number tells you what curve you're on. You choose the right x position, go up to the appropriate curve, go over to the left side, read over the fraction of Q over Q max. Now remember you can calculate Q max as MCP delta T, where delta T is the initial temperature of the body minus the final temperature of the body, which has to be the temperature of the surrounding fluid T infinity. So there's the equation so you don't forget it and of course you don't have to have the mass necessarily, it could be the density and the volume of the body, but you know that'll allow you to calculate Q max and get what you really want. Now finally when you get the actual dimensionless temperature what you're getting is T X T minus T sub infinity over T I minus T infinity going to that second box uh, and the first equation in the second box, it's the left hand side. And what you really want is T of X comma T. So finally you can rearrange this whole mess and come up with the actual temperature. So as it's written, the right-hand side is what you get from the charts, but you still have to rearrange things a little bit using the initial temperature of the body and the temperature of the fluid surrounding the body. Now there is an error on page 479 that uh, has this figure. He put dots above it. I don't know how, I don't know why, but it should be energy, it should not be power, so make sure you make that correction. Now what about for a cylinder? Well, there's a separate chart for cylinders. Really, we're dealing with a different equation, but now let's dig a little deeper. Notice that all of these charts have a line of 1 over BO number equals 0. Now, how is that possible? Because, remember, the BO number is conductive resistance over convective resistance. If we invert that, which is what this is doing, that's convective resistance over conductive resistance. Does that mean that the conductive resistance is infinite? I mean, that sounds like a lump parameter problem. No, that's not what it means. What it means is that the convective resistance is essentially zero. Okay? So if the convective resistance is zero, well, let's see. Let's see. The 1 over BO number would be convective resistance over conductive resistance. Yeah, so convective resistance being zero would give us a 1 over BO number of zero. So what does that mean? Well, what that really means is that the surface temperature of the body is specified. Now, notice we've got charts for walls, for cylinders, and spheres. They all have a 1 over BO number line equal to zero, and all of those lines are for the surface temperature of the body specified. Pause the video and right now go mark on those lines, put an arrow to it, and mark on it and say, this means that the surface temperature of the body is specified. Okay, so for whatever reason we've got a body and somehow we're holding the surface temperature at some level, and so uh, or another way to say it is that the convective resistance is zero. And so we're just transferring heat within the body with the surface temperature of that body specified. That's what those curves are for. They're a little bit special. They're not like the rest of them. So it's not an infinite, infinite BO number. It's just the surface temperature specified. Because it's not possible to have an actual convective uh, heat transfer coefficient that is infinite. Okay, so H equals infinity doesn't make any sense. And so your author has a really nice figure that explains this. So look at this, where B is the case for that zero line, where the surface temperature is just whatever we make it. So back to this particular chart. This one's for cylinders. Works exactly like the plain wall did. We're dealing with the second equation in the lower box. The uh, first uh, parameter, theta naught, comes from the upper chart. But there's another piece. There's the position dependent piece. So we've got the upper piece, the theta naught piece. There it is. We need the second piece. That's that theta piece. And it's the bezel function, but we don't want to do that. We want to get it from a chart, so we can. And this looks a lot like the last chart, but it is different. It's for a cylinder, and it will give you different results. Okay? It, again, depends on the BO number, depends on the dimensionless position, and is a modifier, if you will, a position modifier for finally getting the dimensionless temperature from the centerline dimensionless temperature. We can play the same game with Q over Q max for cylinders as well. All right, there is another chart for spheres. So it's the same story, it's just a different equation, different solution to a different differential equation because the body is changed, right? It's different. It's got a single point at the center rather than either a plane 
uh, or a line for the last two models. And we're just doing the same thing, breaking it down into two pieces. The center line piece, which we get from the upper chart. The position piece, which we get from another, pe uh, another chart, so we don't have to plug uh, numbers into our calculator. Multiply the two together, there's our overall dimensionless temperature. And we've got yet another chart for Q over Q max for this particular body shape.